In case there's somebody here today who hasn't been moved enough to raise your hand or say praise the Lord, this would be a great time to do it right here for all that he has done and everything he has blessed us with and for who he is. Now, Father, we come to the moment. It's a, an extremely holy moment because an eternal thing will happen here, something that will affect us for the rest of our lives. We will hear truth. And how we react to that truth will determine the direction that we will take today and possibly forever. So I ask for divine guidance, holy enablement, and for hearing ears as we delve into your word. Teach us your word and your ways, Lord, and lead us in a plain path. In Jesus' name, order our steps in your word, dear Lord. You are worthy of it all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. From you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. Hallelujah. I think I'll just ask you to go ahead and be seated. Let's begin. Uh, let me tell you that we have heard from uh, Paul and Gabby Schmidgall, and they have had to flee Abood. They and Jennifer Gwen, as you just mentioned, are now in Jerusalem at the Ch Mount of Olives Church of God um, for their safety. There is an, a looming war over there from the north in Lebanon, Hezbollah, and all of Iran's proxies and from the south or the southeast, uh, Hamas continues. And I feel an urgency this morning to remind you time is running out. You cannot read the headlines and not be stirred about where we are in this world. Jesus is coming. This is not a time to fool around and play with your soul and experiment with religion. This is a time to be aggressive with the Lord and determined in your living. We only see a small fraction or hear about a small portion of the sin, the degradation in our world. God sees it all. And I want to tell you that Jesus taught us when you least expect it, the Son of Man is going to come. He's coming. I don't really care what anybody thinks about, you know, uh, you know, different opinions about the rapture, whether there is one or when it occurs during the tribulation. That's all Tommy rot to me. The Bible says Jesus could come at any moment and he will come to deliver his church from the great tribulation, which is a time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's. So while I'm speaking to you, the Lord could look over towards Gabriel and the trumpet could blast and he could call us to meet him in the clouds. There'll be no time to get ready. You have to be ready all the time. For uh, uh, several years now, I've been hearing about something called the red letter Christian movement. Red letter Christians. 
You probably know about it. It's a new group, a new movement that only follow, read, study the words of Jesus. And they call themselves red letter Christians because in a lot of Bibles, the words of Jesus are in red letters. <clears throat> and so they've decided that for some reason, <clears throat> the words of Paul, Peter, James, John are too harsh or they are uh, not applicable for us because Jesus is the truth and Jesus spoke the truth. There is no other truth but the words of Jesus. Um, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I, I want to, I'm not stuttering, I'm not stammering, I'm trying to choose the right words here. No word in the Bible is more important than any other word. The words of Jesus are not more important than the words of Micah, Moses, or James, you see. You don't categorize words or books of the Bible. This is all the Word of God. And in order to understand or grasp God, it takes the whole counsel of God. So to emphasize the red letters, the words of Jesus, is to emphasize a portion of the word which, make, which makes you spiritually deficient, scripturally ignorant. So when I hear about these things, I think, wh what are people thinking? I can't figure people out. Where do you come up with this stuff? There's always a new word, a new movement, a new prophecy, a new this, a new that, and it's always confusing people. So let's just see what Jesus said. Let's look at some of the words of Jesus. He looked at people and said, you're wicked. He looked at others and said, you're a hypocrite. And others he called liars. And even others, he said, you are of your father, the devil. Now, how soft is that? Jesus didn't mince words. What are some other things Jesus talked about? This is just Jesus. Jesus said, strive to enter the narrow gate. For the gate that leads to destruction is broad and wide and plenty of people are going through it. But the road or the gate that leads to heaven is narrow. And few there be that find it. That's what Jesus said. Few. Jesus said, unless you hate father, mother, brothers, sisters, houses, lands, Unless you reject everything but me, you cannot be my disciple. I will not share you with anybody. I will not allow you to share your passions with anything else. Jesus said, unless you forsake all and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Jesus said, Unless you take up a cross every day and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Jesus, in essence, said, if you break one rule of the law, you've broken them all. So this idea that you're doing better than you used to, you don't cuss as much, you don't do as much dope, uh, you don't chase as many women as you used to, or men, this idea that you are progressing, growing, and uh, are, are sinning less will not cut it with Jesus Christ unless you are willing to viciously sever everything from your heart and mind except the Lord Jesus, you will never go to heaven. 
If you break one law, you've broken the laws of God and you are guilty of it all. Jesus said, you must be born again. Jesus said, unless you come through me, you will never know who the Father is. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the light. I am the bread. I am the good shepherd. I am the Savior of the world. Unless you believe that, every bit of that, you have no spiritual life in you. Jesus said you can't go to heaven the way you are. You must have a spiritual transformation, a new birth. You must be born out of darkness into the light. I'm not going to tell you anything new today. Jesus specifically and emphatically taught that religion will send you to hell. You will start thinking that what the church teaches is always what Jesus teaches, and many times it is not. Jesus said, if a man looks at a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery with her in his heart. That's pretty strong. Jesus said, if a man divorces his wife for any reason except adultery, he commits sin. He commits adultery. Jesus said, if you marry someone who has been divorced, you have also committed adultery. Jesus said, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts off. He takes away. Did you notice those words? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lops off, cuts away, takes away. Then he said they are gathered up and they are thrown into the fire. And he was simply painting a picture of eternal fire and damnation that comes at the end of the age. Jesus said, in the beginning, he created them male and female. So it doesn't matter how sympathetic you are towards people who are struggling with gender or sexuality, you always go back to Holy Scripture. Jesus said, in the beginning, God created them male and female. There is nothing else and there is no more. And for anybody to insinuate that there might be is to deny the word of God. Hmm. Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to the kingdom of heaven or make it to the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, hell is such a bad place, such a horrible, indescribably miserable place, that if your eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out. It would be better for you to go into heaven with one eye, or no eyes, than to go into hell with two 2020 eyes. Jesus said, if your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. If your foot is causing you to go where you ought not to go, cut it off. It's better to go into heaven maimed than to go to hell with a total and whole body. Now you know, you've been here long enough and I've preached long enough to know that Jesus was not saying literally amputate your limbs. It was his dramatic and truthful way of saying, you don't want to go to hell. So whatever part of you is giving you trouble, you deal with it. And you deal with it mercilessly. 
and you crucify that part that is causing you to stumble. I turned over to Luke chapter 13 and I read this. He went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? Here we go. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Then you will begin to say, Lord, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. I don't know where you're from. Depart from me. All you are workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a parable. This is what Jesus is saying. I haven't even mentioned Paul yet, or James, or Peter, or John. Jesus said there's actually going to be a time when the door is shut. And there will be people say, whoa, wait just a minute, and bang on the door. Let us in, let us in. I don't know you. But Lord, we ate and drank in your presence. I think I need to offer a, a kind, compassionate warning to people who may be watching me on, on the camera there. Don't put undue confidence in the sacraments. Just because you are a Catholic or an Episcopalian or a Lutheran or a, a Church of England or even Methodist or anything like that, and you take communion and you eat the Eucharist and you drink the bread and, or eat the bread and drink the wine does not mean you know Jesus. And it could be said that that's what they're saying here. We did all that. And you need to be very careful that your faith is not in your church rather than in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would continue. I don't ever want to be offensive, but I have to tell you the truth. You can think that because you belong to one of those churches or any church and you're going through the motions of religion that somehow the door is going to remain open for you, but there is only one thing that matters to the Lord God. Do you follow Jesus ardently? Do you pursue him? Are you aggressive in your service, in your worship, and in your obedience. Lord, we ate and drank in your presence. We didn't miss church. We did all of the religious stuff. Depart from me, I don't know who you are. And that's one of the reasons Jesus condemned religion the way he did. And one of the reasons that today religion is sending people to hell. There is a, a, a languid approach to Jesus because people take solace in the fact that they belong to a church, involved in a church. But nothing can become a substitute for your personal walk, your personal devotion, your time with God every day, and living in the Word of God. Nothing else matters. That one disturbed me a little bit because they were sincerely saying, wait a minute, we did all the stuff we thought we were supposed to do. <clears throat> but it wasn't what Jesus told them to do. That's why you have to live in the Word of God. You cannot depend on what I tell you, church. You have to have your own Bible marked up you have to have your own Bible used up. It's got to be dog-eared and worn because you have read it and studied it and prayed over it and cried in it. You can't live off what the preacher tells 
you every day or every Sunday. I come here with the truth the best I know how. I prepare my heart the best I know how. But my preaching cannot get you to heaven. You have to have a personal relationship, a brokenness about you where you want Jesus and Jesus alone. Church can't satisfy a child of God unless Jesus is in the middle of it. No amount of religious activity can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can quench the thirst of your heart and fill your empty belly. Only Jesus can make you what you ought to be and give you what you ought to have. So I kept reading. For some time now, this, these verses have disturbed me. Jesus said in John chapter 14, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. You see it, church? You can't say you love Jesus if you don't keep his commandments. And he who loves me, watch this. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. I have to be very careful right here. Someone sent me a wonderful book the other day from uh, halfway across the country. I read a little bit in it and it touched my heart and they said something to this effect. We have gone way overboard with, I, with this idea. Jesus loves you no matter what. Does he? If you don't love him, if you don't love the Father, what did I just read? It is he who loves me who keeps my commandments. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. If any man loves me, he will keep my word. He who does not love me does not keep my words. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So keeping his commandments guarantees that you remain in his love. Whoa. But then I found this other verse too. Proverbs. Listen. Proverbs chapter 8, listen to this verse. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Have you ever read that? I love those who love me. What if someone doesn't love him? He is not abiding in his love. He does not remain in his love. I love those who love me. Never read it in my whole life. Never saw it like that before. But it did something to me. It made me understand that I, I use this word again, I cannot have a passive approach to God Almighty. I cannot yawn my way through life spiritually. I must have a prayer life. I must be a student of God's Word. I must cry out for wisdom and knowledge. I must entreat the Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit today again. I beg you who were brought up in certain camps of religion, whether, here we go again, 
whether you are an Ar Arminian, um, a Calvinist, none of that matters to God. None of it. If you lean on that and what that teaches and your soul is not screaming to be filled with Jesus, you are about to be deceived. That's why Jesus condemned religion. Because certain people believe a certain way and others believe another way and each camp believes they're the right way. And so they are locked into it. This is who I am. This is what I believe. And then every time you pick up the Bible to read, you read it through the eyes of religion instead of the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what I said? People that believe in once saved, always saved. Look at every verse through that lens. They make every verse fit that. People who believe you can lose your salvation, read every verse with that in mind. They make every verse fit that. What do you do, pastor? There's only one thing you can do. You get your Bible. You get on your knees. You crawl before God. You read. You cry. You pray. You search the Scriptures. Because that proverb I just read to you, those that uh, seek me early will find me. Did you just hear me read that? It means those who seek me first. Doesn't just mean the time of the day. It means first. This is our first service. This is our early service. It's first and early because it comes before the second one. Are you with me? This is 8.30. That's 10.30. Jesus said, those that seek me first, those that seek me early, will find me. There cannot be a lazy approach to this. We are talking about eternity, hell, heaven. We are talking about the most solemn thing in this world today. We will all stand before God. If we're washed in the blood, we will stand before Jesus on judgment day and he will evaluate our works. If you don't know Christ, if you put your faith in anything but Jesus, you will stand before the judge of all the earth to hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. So there is no reason why I should stand up here today and try to preach a nice sermon to make everybody feel better. I'm a desperate, dying preacher. I'm trying to get some of you to understand today is the day of salvation and you got to stop playing around with God. Make up your mind. John taught, every man that has this hope, every person that has this hope of seeing Jesus will purify himself even as he is pure. Purify yourself. Come out from the world. Be separate. Be different. Don't ever say again, I, well, I'm saved eternally, so God understands how I'm living right now. Don't ever say that again. The issue is not how long you're saved. The issue is that you're walking in obedience today. One day at a time. The point is not how much you can get away with, but how close you can live to Jesus. There are no excuses for living in sin. None. You have no excuse. You have the Word of God. You have the Holy Spirit. You have knees to pray on. You have brothers and sisters to talk to. There is no excuse for people living in sin and saying that they struggle all the time and just can't get victory. 
Every man that has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. And I say these things today because as I prayed this week and, and then I would hear bits and pieces of what's going on in the world and the mess our country is in. Nobody trusts anybody. Nobody has any faith in one department of our government or politics. Nobody has any faith in the medical world in the legal world, in the industrial world, nobody. We believe everybody's cheating us. I think they are. <laughs> everybody's trying to get as much as they can, therefore it really doesn't matter how they get it, and that begins to build up in you after a while. This is a bad world we're living in. The world is on the precipice of damnation, and destruction. But Jesus was so sweet and kind to tell his people in his day, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. When you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your head, your redemption draws nigh. That's what he was saying to Israel during the tribulation period. But then the Holy Spirit taught Paul a mystery, and he opened it up. And the mystery is what we are anticipating could happen any moment, the rapture of the church. I think I'll make a little uh, change here. I sat with a friend the other day and had a, conversation. He was much more animated than I was. And as he began to tell me about it, I got animated. He said, last week he was sitting with friends, friends, associates, and this thing about the Lord's Supper mockery came up. The Olympics, Lord's Supper, mockery, blasphemy. And he said, I became so incensed, I just I couldn't control myself, and I said, why are they doing this? This is an insult. How do they get away with this? Who let this happen? And his other friends said, what's the big deal? One was Catholic. They would all claim to be Christians. And I thought to myself as he explained, why wouldn't any born-again believer so, be so enraged about this. How could anybody say, it's just the way it is. God loves everybody. One pastor here in town said concerning that, you see there was a picture. Uh, the top picture was the original painting of the, the Lord's Supper, and under it was this uh, Olympic mockery under it. And that pastor said, hey, Jesus loves the ones on the bottom as much as he loves the one on the top. What's the big deal? Just enjoy the Olympics. Now, I can't help it. I can't help it. There's something wrong with people. And that's why I tell you all the time, just because you belong to a certain church does not guarantee your salvation. There is something wrong with people who don't have such a spirit uh, of... Uh, discernment about them, that they can just go through life and see all of this perversion, sin, and not be stirred up about it? How many times have I preached this in this church? That when Paul went to Athens, he saw all the gods that were there, stone gods, and the Bible says his spirit was stirred within him. I'm going to tell you something. If your spirit is not stirred today about what's going on in this country and in this world, if you can just say, ah, that's the way it is, the Holy Spirit does not abide in you because the Holy Spirit gets insulted and the Holy Spirit gets upset and the Holy Spirit gets stirred up. 
So if you're stirred up, you're not just an angry person. You're a born again person and you have the Holy Ghost abiding in your heart. I'm stirred up and I'm stirred up enough to preach the way I'm preaching this morning. Jesus is coming soon, but he ain't coming for church members. And he's not coming for people playing with sin. And he's not coming for people who won't read their Bible and go to prayer meeting. He's coming back for those that look for him. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So... We're taught in God's Word. Say no to ungodliness. If you don't know the guts of this church the way we do, staff members and leaders, you might wonder why I get so uh, invigorated at times. Because I constantly hear of people who sit on these pews but are indulging in a life of sin. I can't figure it out. How can you sit here? How can you sit in this church and hear this kind of Bible preaching and then go out and do it again? The grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You hear me this morning, church? There's probably a man watching right now who, for a number of years, was here. He was an usher. He was a friend of mine and a friend of all of us. Uh, well, a lot of us. And I'm saying this now. And if he's listening, I won't call your name. You're going to feel like everybody's looking at you, but they don't know where you are. But you decided that you've had such a difficult time lately that it's okay for you to commit adultery. You sat in this church you were an usher in this church. You were with a lot of us in this church, but because you had a tragedy, a marital tragedy, you feel okay now to commit the sin you are committing. You've, cho you've chosen a bedroom over a prayer room. And it wasn't that long ago that I talked to you and you looked me in the eyes and you said, I got to get back in church. I'm, I just got to get back in church. I heard what you said the other day. I got to get back in church. Here's my question. How much time do you think you have? I'm asking everybody. How much time do we think we have? I'm living every day as though it's my last day. How much time do we think we have? Oh, pastor, I hate for it to end on a Sour note like this. Why? I'll tell you, when Jesus left a group, they weren't jumping up and down. And when Paul left that group in Athens, they weren't saying, wasn't that a good rich word? Don't you feel better now? Yippee! Nope. When men of God walked into town and spoke the word of God, people who didn't know God were convicted by God. And here's my job. I'll close with this. I'm doing my job right now. I am trying to get a church rapture ready. I'm trying to get everybody who's on the fringe to come on in. People dabbling their feet on the edge of the river, just jump on in. There is nothing out there worth having. There's nothing out there worth going to hell over. Jesus Christ paid the price. Jesus Christ meets all the needs. I don't know why you wouldn't right now Stand up and say, this is my day. I will serve the Lord the rest of my life. He will be my life for as long as I live.
Stand with me, please. Father in heaven, I praise you. I bless you. There is one thing that matters to me, Lord, and the church is listening. Before I left the prayer room this morning, I said to you, let me please you today, whether they like it or not. Let me be approved by you today, Lord Jesus. That's still my prayer. And so I'm, I'm saying to anybody here now, one of the, when I was a little boy, and the preacher got on that rapture thing, and he said, it could happen before the church service is over. Even as a little boy, my blood would begin to flow a little bit faster through my body. I was a little boy. But I knew that I didn't have any time to get anything right. I had to be ready all the time. I wonder if everybody here understands that. You have to be ready right now. All sins forgiven right now. Under the blood right now. No more experimentation with God. No more half-hearted service to God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. As the deer pants after the water brooks, so my soul pants after you. My soul follows hard after God. There isn't much time left. So David's playing the song. We sing quite a bit. If there's anybody in here today not living right, if sin is in your life, here's the good news. His blood in a split second can cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. In a split second. If we confess our sins, Pastor, we know all those verses. This is the Word of God. It doesn't matter how many times you've heard it. It's real. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Call on the Lord while He is near. Call on Him while He may be found. He is waiting for you. Feel free to come down. You know, I'm going to get dramatic again because I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of people in hell right now that would give everything for two seconds where you're sitting and standing that they could say, God be merciful to be a sinner. But it's over. No need knocking on the door when you can have it right now.